All right, this evening uh, we are going to, um, uh, well, I've already told you what we're looking at, but I want to read for you another passage of Scripture. And this one comes from uh, Romans chapter 8, and I'd like to read verses 28 through 39. But what we're going to be looking at, at least from this particular text, is under our second point, comes in verses 33 and 34. So let's begin by looking at uh, verses or reading verses 28 through 39. And again, these are perhaps some of the most encouraging words that the Lord has given to us in Scripture. And as I read them, realize if you're trusting Jesus, these apply to you. Uh, This is what the Lord is doing for you. Beginning in verse 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ, will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, we're not going to focus just on this text. We're going to look at several Uh, passages, but again, we want to focus on what our Lord Jesus Christ is doing for us now in heaven, how he ministers to us in each of these three offices. So again, by way of reminder, this morning we saw how our Lord humbled himself, came into this world to become our Savior. Remember, to minister to us, to serve us as our prophet, our priest, and our king. As our prophet, he came to uh, show us the Father, to teach us what he's like, to show us what he's like. And of course, he also came to preach the gospel so that we might uh, be reconciled to him. As our priest, he did what was necessary to reconcile us to the Father. He prayed for us, and he sacrificed himself for us. And this was so that we might not just know about God through his prophetic office, through his teaching, but that we might actually come to know him in a personal relationship as his children, as his sons and his daughters. And of course, he couldn't have reconciled us unless he, as our king, had subdued our enemy, the one that Adam handed us over to in the garden, the one who had us basically bound in chains in his kingdom. He rescued us by striking the enemy He's bound the strong man, he's plundered his house, he's brought us out of his kingdom into his own kingdom through his work on the cross. And then we also saw that after Jesus died and rose again, after he finished this, basically his work, he um, was exalted. He taught his disciples for another 40 days, and then he ascended triumphantly into heaven, remember on the clouds, as it were, riding the chariot of God because Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. And as he was lifted up into heaven, he was exalted to the right hand of God. This was the day of Jesus' coronation, the day that he was crowned king when he took up the rule over all of creation 
now as the God-man with the promise that everyone would one day bow the knee to him. And one thing I perhaps didn't mention, but I, I think you, you know, is that uh, with his promise, the Father has given Jesus to subdue all of his enemies under his feet. As he subdues these enemies, these are our enemies too that are being subdued. So the Lord is going to defeat everything that stands against him and because we're in his kingdom, it stands against us. So Jesus, being God, humbled himself to become a man, and as a man, humbled himself even further by becoming a servant to us, that we might become the children of God, and for this, he was exalted to the place of highest authority and given the name above every name. But let's also not forget that he did this as an example to us, so that we might know also the path that leads to honor and glory in his kingdom. The one who is greatest in the kingdom is the one who becomes the least of all, the last of all, the servant of all. Now, Sinclair Ferguson, in our study on Wednesdays, reminded us in the study on the upper room that Jesus humbling himself at the Last Supper in the washing of the disciples' feet was a sign or a picture of his earthly ministry to us, of his work of redemption. But I want us to be reminded this evening that that ministry did not end when Jesus ascended to heaven. Jesus continues his work in the same three areas, only now in different ways. The fact that he does this is the reason why you and I will see heaven. But again, like other things that have to do with sanctification. The fact that the Lord is doing these things in and of itself is, is not going to be as profitable as if we understand what he's doing and we cooperate with him. Remember sanctification, our growth into the likeness of Jesus is a work that we also are involved in. If we don't do the work that, that is ours to do, then we're not going to benefit, we're not going to become as much like him as we might otherwise uh, become. So let's understand what the Lord is, is doing through these uh, three different offices and let's learn uh, to cooperate uh, with him as much as we are able to. Now, first of all, Jesus continues to minister to us as prophet. We saw this in our meditation where Paul writes to the Ephesians in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 4, but you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. Now, I've already noted to you that this church at Ephesus was established by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. It was made up primarily of Gentiles who, of course, prior to Paul's arrival had not heard about Jesus perhaps and certainly weren't interested in Jesus. They hadn't seen Jesus and they certainly had never heard him teach or preach. And yet, Paul said they had both heard him and had been taught by him. Now the question would be, of course, how is it that they heard Jesus? Well, they heard him through his word, as the Spirit of God opened their minds and their hearts to hear him. John Gill, in his commentary on the New Testament on this particular passage, uh, writes this when he comments on this section, if so be that you have heard him. He says, not heard him preach, but heard him preached. And that, not merely externally with the outward hearing of the ear, though oft times spiritual conviction and illumination, true faith in Christ, real comfort from Him, and establishment and assurance of interest in Him come this way as to these Ephesians, so not merely externally, but internally, so as to know Him, understand His words, and distinguish his voice so as to approve of him and love him and believe in him, feel the power of his gospel, relish his truths and obey his ordinances and so bring forth fruit to his glory. 
And such do who are quickened by him, whose ears are unstopped and their hearts opened and their understandings enlightened, and who having ears and understanding hearts given them. So the Ephesians may not have seen Jesus, they may not have heard him preaching physically, as it were, audibly, but they did hear Jesus. Now the point is, is this, that even though Jesus is in heaven, he continues to speak, and he continues to speak to us. He teaches us the things that we need to know, not only so that we can be saved, but also that we might make it safely to heaven. And along the way, do what it is that the Lord calls us to do and in the way that would be honoring to Him. He speaks to us through His Word as we hear it in different ways. He is speaking to us, as a matter of fact, now, even though you may, I mean, you see me and I'm speaking and so forth, yet I am relating to you His truth. And this is one of the ways by which the Lord speaks when His Word is read when his word is taught, and when it's preached. The Lord speaks to us at the weekly study when we get together to uh, study the, the Bible, when we do the reading the Bible together and we share the insights, the passages of Scripture. Jesus is speaking as we read and share those ideas. When we participate in the Ferguson study and as he opens up the Scriptures for us and teaches us, Jesus is speaking. Jesus speaks to us in our private devotions as we read His Word, as we meditate on His Word, as we read books that are also expositions of His Word. He speaks to us when we spend time together in fellowship, after the services, maybe after the Wednesday night study. We talk about the Word of God, and we try to help one another understand it. We try to help one another apply it and to deal with the issues that we have to face. Jesus is ministering His uh, through his office as prophet, every time we open his word, he speaks to us. He gives us light. You know how the scripture tells us that God's word is like a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. The Lord illumines the way before us so that we can avoid the things that are dangerous to us in this world, so we can avoid the traps that our enemy lays for our souls in this world. I think we all understand that just having a Bible isn't going to do us any good as long as the Bible is, is closed. We, we do need to read it. We need to have it open all the time. Now, we don't necessarily need to carry it around with us all the time and be reading it constantly, although I, I would have to say that wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea. And I think the people who read it the most are the ones who are going to benefit the most. But we do need to have the Word of God continually opened in our minds. We need to remember what the Lord says, and we need to meditate on what He says. We need to pray what the Lord says. We can even sing what He says. You know, there are scripture songs, there are hymns, there are psalms that we can learn that have the Word of God, that keep it continually before us. We need to have the Word of God open in our minds. We need to have it upon our hearts. We need to believe what we hear. We need to trust what Jesus says. We need to use it as our guide. We need to make choices based upon it. Remember, life is nothing more, certainly nothing less, than a series of choices that we're continually faced with. Jesus wants to help us in those choices. He wants to guide us through these choices. He wants to give us the wisdom that we need to live. And the Lord will give us that wisdom if we will only listen to what he has to say. You know, that's really all the Lord has ever really wanted his people to do. I think you remember throughout the entire scripture, especially in the Old Testament, the Lord is saying, listen to my voice. If you listen and you do, it will go well with you. He says through Isaiah the prophet to his people when they hadn't listened, and now we're facing his judgment. I think it was one of the, um, perhaps one of the um, battles, one of the wars they were fighting that ended in their exile. He says in Isaiah 30, verses 20 and 21, although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of opposition, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself. 
but your eyes will behold your teacher. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left, of course, the Lord is looking beyond the present circumstances, and he's talking about the blessings, perhaps the blessings of the new covenant. But certainly, the Lord has given to us, as we know from the first study we looked at by Sinclair Ferguson on who is the Holy Spirit, that he has given us the Spirit as our comforter. He has given him to us as our teacher and, and our guide. And the way he works, of course, is through the Word of God. So as we have the Spirit and as we have the Word, we have this continual voice telling us which way to go, no matter which, you know, where we are and what we're doing. We have wisdom to make choices that are honoring to the Lord. This is the Lord's ministry to us, his continuing ministry, as our prophet. Now, Jesus also continues his ministry to us as priests. It didn't end with his sacrifice on the cross. He still prays for us from heaven. And we saw that in Romans chapter 8, verses 33 through 34, where Paul writes, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. He is our great high priest. Now remember, a priest is someone that the Lord in his mercy has provided for us, someone who stands between God and between man in order to bring them together. In order to do this, the priest has to do two things. He has to make a sacrifice in order to atone for sins, and he needs to pray. He needs to intercede before God on behalf of the people that God might receive that sacrifice on their behalf, might forgive his people, and he might bless them. This is exactly what the Father has called Jesus to do for us. Uh, listen to what the author of the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 4, th <coughs> verses 4 through 6. And no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. God has provided for us a high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we saw this morning that Jesus, while he was on earth, prayed for us and he sacrificed for us. He sacrificed himself. But now he continues to do this work in heaven. He doesn't make any new sacrifices for us because the one that he made on the cross is the last one that we will ever need. It's the last one that anyone will ever need. As we read this morning in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So Jesus doesn't need to make another sacrifice. He has made the once for all sacrifice of himself. But what he does continue to do is to intercede for us. He's seated at the right hand of the Father and he is praying for us. He appears before the Father for us. Matthew Henry writes this in his commentary. He is there, not unconcerned about us, not forgetful of us, but making intercession. He is an agent for us there, an advocate for us to answer all accusations, to put in our plea, and to prosecute it with effect, to appear for us and to present our petitions. And is not this abundant matter for comfort? What shall we say to these things? Is this the manner of men, O Lord God? What room is left for doubting and disquietment? 
Why art thou cast down, O my soul? If Jesus is pleading before the Father for us, how can we be discouraged? How can we be disappointed? How can we be disheartened? We are going to make it to heaven because of that. Now again, Jesus is perfectly equipped to do this for us. <coughs> Remember the author to the Hebrews tells us that God uses men as mediators rather than angels. And the reason he does that is because they know better how to pray for men than angels do because they know the weakness of men. Again, the author to the Hebrews in chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. <coughs> now this is why Jesus became one with us. This is why he came into the world as a man, why he came from the very beginning as a babe and not a full-grown man, so that he might experience the things that we experience, everything that we have to go through in life. I mean, Jesus has even gone through death. He knows what it is to experience death, so he is able to help us. He's able to sympathize. He knows our weakness, not the weakness of our sin, but the weakness of our humanity. He knows our frailty. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to be hungry, to be weak. Again, he knows what it is to be sick. He knows what it is to, to suffer. He knows what it is to die. And because he knows what we are going through, he knows exactly how to pray for us. He knows what each of us are actually going through this evening. Now, again, we're all going through different things. We all know what those things are. We may not be aware of them amongst ourselves, but we all have various trials. Now, Jesus may not have experienced the exact situation that we're facing, but he's been through something like it. He knows what we need. He prays for what we need. And the father hears him because these are the prayers of his son and his son who is praying for those who are near to his son. And he also, of course, Jesus is praying according to the will of the father who has put Jesus there in order to pray for us because the father himself loves us. And he's going to listen because of what Jesus has done in his earthly work. And essentially what this means is that we are as Matthew Henry already told us, we are going to make it. We're going to make it through this world. It's not going to destroy us. It's not going to overcome us. We are going to make it to heaven if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus. We need to believe that we will make it to heaven because Jesus stands in the presence of God for us. If that is what he's doing, we must make it to heaven. So essentially that is our assurance. Now, finally, Jesus continues his ministry to us as our king. And here we come back to another portion of the text that I read in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where Paul writes, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And the reason why they do is because there's one who's in control of all these circumstances, who is working them together for our good. Now remember this morning we saw that Jesus for the work that was that he did for us. That for that he received that tremendous exaltation, all power and authority has been given to him. He is in absolute control of everything. And being in control, he's going to make sure that whatever he brings into our lives, whatever he allows in our lives, that he is going to also work together for our good. And that includes absolutely everything. The trials we were just talking about, spiritual battles that we have to face. 
if they're from, you know, whatever, well, they all come ultimately from the Lord, but from whatever uh, quarter they may arise, the Lord is in control. Now, remember, last Wednesday, we were reminded of something that Luther said. The devil is God's devil. And what he meant by that was not that God created the devil, although he did create Lucifer, but when he created Lucifer, he was essentially the greatest of all of his uh, creatures who was adorned with beauty and wisdom and so forth. But God made him good, and he became evil through his own choices. Well, that's not what Luther was necessarily referring to, but rather what he meant is that God has absolute control of the devil. Jesus, who has all power and authority entrusted to him, has control over the devil. The devil is on his leash, you might say, and can do nothing more or less than what the Lord allows. I mean, that was true even before Jesus came into the world. God had control of Satan. Remember when the devil wanted to bring difficulties that he brought into Job's life? Before he could do that, he had to go into heaven and ask God for permission to do this. Now, I don't know that that was an isolated event. As a matter of fact, Jesus is, is interceding for us before the throne for a reason. The same is true today with regard to Satan's authority. He can do nothing without Jesus' permission. Now, it is also true in the case of Job, and I think in the case of us as well, that God does sometimes give him permission. He allows him to do certain things, but it's always within certain bounds. Remember the Lord said he can go this far, but no further. What we need to see here is that whatever the Lord may allow him to do, or perhaps the devil has nothing to do with us personally because we're not that important to him, but he certainly has an army of spiritual beings that can create a great deal of mischief as well. Whatever Jesus allows any of them to do, and they're all on leashes, he allows them to do for a good purpose. Jesus is in control. Jesus as king is also in control of all the other enemies that we have to face, even our flesh and the world. And the Lord can use them in order to help us grow as well. Sometimes he can pull back some of the restraint and let us look a little bit more closely at the sin that's in our lives. And when we see it, the Lord gives us the grace to cast ourselves on him, to seek him more earnestly for his grace. He can use that to help us grow. He can also, of course, use the world. Jesus is in control of all of our circumstances. Sometimes we forget (laughs) that everything that happens in our lives, everything that comes into our lives is a part of his plan. None of it is accidental. None of it happens by accident. The Lord has brought it for a purpose, and it's always a good purpose. We need to actually see it in that light and to know that this is not an accident. This is not something that that just happened, but it's something that God has brought for a specific purpose. And really, as I've said, that includes absolutely everything that is happening. And of course, the Lord wants us to make right choices according to his word as we're faced with these different circumstances. But let's not forget, even though that means all the things we don't necessarily like that he has brought into our lives, that even when that happens, he still has a good purpose behind it. And it's a very good purpose. Paul tells us that if we love him, which we do if we have trusted Jesus, because we really can't trust him without loving him, that he is working everything together, all the things that he brings into our lives together for our good. He is working them all together for our growth in grace. He's making us more like Jesus so that he can use us more here, bring more glory and honor to him here, and so that he might also prepare us for heaven And allow us also to, again, store up treasures in heaven that we might be able to present before him on that day. So this is what Jesus is doing. And we need to learn to respond accordingly or appropriately to each of these different things. We need to learn to trust him. 
we need to learn to trust His Word and let the Lord guide us through His Word, make our choices based upon the Word. And, of course, we can't do that as long as the Word is closed. It needs to be open at all times. It needs to be in our minds. It needs to be in our hearts. We need to make choices based upon what the Lord is telling us. This is the way. Walk in it. We need to trust the Lord's intercession for us in heaven. That that is our hope of heaven. Not that we are going to persevere to the end in our own strength. We are going to persevere because of what Jesus is doing for us even now. His prophetic office gives us the right direction. His priestly work provides for us the, the power that we need in order to do this. The forgiveness, the help that we need from the Lord. He is the one who is providing that continually for us, and that is the reason why we will persevere and we will make it. We need to trust that. We need to believe that. We need to believe that He is praying for us exactly as we need to be prayed for. And we need to trust that the Lord, in His love, uh, really cares about us, and is bringing into our lives the particular things that we have to face now because that is exactly what we need. I mean, the Lord doesn't want us to remain static. He doesn't want us to remain as we are. He wants us to become like Jesus, and that usually happens through the furnace of adversity. It happens through difficulties. It happens through trials, not exclusively, but certainly if we, as we read the Bible, we see that that is often how the Lord works. Well, Jesus is in control as our king. And he is bringing into our lives those things that need to happen so that we can grow into his image. We need to trust. We need to believe that that is the case. And we need to know that there is a good purpose behind it, a loving purpose. And, and that is that the Lord is working his image in us and preparing us for heaven. Really, if, if we can wrap our minds around that, if we can believe that and trust that, then we can have the strongest assurance that is possible. Listen to Jesus, believe in his intercession for you that he is, and know that he is working all things together to conspire to that end, working them together to make you like him. For that, we should be thankful. Jesus continues to minister to us from heaven and that is why we will make it to heaven. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to uh, help us to trust Him, to trust and to respond to each of these things that He is doing in the way uh, that we ought.